So a rain garden um, is basically a planted area where water collects in a shallow basin um, and what you're trying to do is encourage the rainwater to absorb into the water so it's not going into our stormwater drains, it's not going into our local creeks, it's able to actually be filtered and absorbed into the earth um, rather than just flowing right off of your property. Um, so main things are kind of goals of it are decreasing the, the runoff um, and in that you're decreasing any kind of pollutants that might be moving with the water, um, also preventing erosion uh, that happens with that storm water just running off of your property, um, lowering the water into the storm systems and the creeks. Um, one of the other big goals of it is providing food and habitat for um, not only our pollinators but just kind of going right up the line for our birds and other wildlife. Um, and then it does beautify your yard. It's going to improve your your property value because you're taking care of the water on your on your property rather than having wet low spots, things like that, that grass won't grow, things like that that are just kind of eyesores. The rain gardens will help alleviate some of those issues. And I do have to mention that it's helping with the systems, but it does not solve it all together. We always build overflow systems into rain gardens because as everyone knows with St. Louis rains we can get some very heavy rains for a couple of days. So it's designed to absorb the water for maybe 70 percent of rain events but then we build a an overflow into it so that it does um, it does have somewhere to go. Uh, when we do have the heavy rain events. Um, but it's going to help with standing water in the yard um, and it's going to be basically intercepting that water before it gets to those low spots to help it drain in. Um, it's also going to help with like flooding of basements and things like that so that you can capture again that water, get it away from the house to a rain garden. Um, and then it's also going to help soil erosion issues. So one of the things I want to just kind of mention is where the best spot to put your rain garden is. Um, I'm actually going to go through first where not to put a rain garden. Um, and one area is a woodland. Um, trees and their huge root systems are some of our best absorbers. Um, so you don't want to put a rain garden right under trees in woodlands where you're getting into root systems and upsetting those trees. Um, you also don't want to put them in really heavily compacted soils um, because you'll end up creating a swamp instead of a rain garden. Um, and that's why we do a percolation test, which I'll talk about a little bit later, so that you make sure before you ever get started that that soil drains well enough to support a rain garden. Um, you also don't want to put it on a really steep slope. Um, you could end up actually destabilizing the slope if you put it on too steep of a slope. Um, and contrary to kind of what it seem, seem, would seem to be common sense, um, you don't, do want to stay away from low, flat, wet spots. So that spot where the water collects in your yard, you actually want to get that water before it gets to that area because that area is most likely very compacted, the water doesn't, the soil doesn't drain very well. Um, so another place not to put a rain garden is too close to your house. You want to stay at least 10, 20 is even better feet away from your house uh, so that you're um, not encouraging that water to get into your foundation. Um, we want to solve water issues, we don't want to create water issues. So after kind of going through where you don't want to put it, where you want to put it, perfect ideal spot is a gentle slope in your yard um, with well draining soil. So you're going to catch that water as it's moving across your yard, letting it soak in, still having some slope past that so that when you do get those heavy rains it can overflow and move off of your property to where it would, would naturally go. Um, and if you don't have those ideal conditions, if you have a really steep slope, if you're soil doesn't drain well, that doesn't mean that you can't do rainscaping. It just means a rain garden is not the best option for you. 
Um, and what you might end up doing is just doing native plantings. Native plants have deep root systems that soak up a lot of water, so that's going to be a great option for you. Um, you could also combine that with permeable pavers. Uh, you could just do um, rainwater harvesting where you put rain barrels to collect water for your for watering your plants or pots, things like that. Um, so just because you may not have the ideal spot for a rain garden doesn't mean you can't still rainscape. Now you're, you have learned something about a rain garden, so you're thinking about actually putting a feature in. So these are some of the things to kind of consider as you're deciding exactly where the best spot for that rain garden is, where that gentle slope is that you can catch the water. So you want to just pay attention to how water moves through your property, especially in a heavy rain. Um, take a little bit of video if you're getting a designer involved. I can tell you us designers love to see videos of water moving through your yard because we may not often be there when there's a heavy downpour going on. Um, so you want to see where your high spot, where your low spot is. Um, you also want to pay attention to the where the water is currently exiting your yard. Um, we do, as I mentioned before, build those overflows into the rain garden so that we're controlling where it overflows when we get those heavy rains. And so we want to make sure that, um, that we're getting it to that spot and not sending it somewhere in your yard that is gonna cause problems. Um, you want to think about the various um, sources of water that are gonna be coming into your rain garden. So you're gonna be looking at your downspouts um, and how much of your roof is coming from those downspouts. You're going to look at sump pumps as well because a lot of us have sump pumps to keep our basements dry that we put into rain gardens. Um, you also want to look if you have rain barrels where your overflows from your rain barrels are. And then you want to be cognizant if you have in the, in the past put in a French drain, anything like that, you want to be cognizant of where those are as well. So you can run those French drains to empty into a rain garden system as well. Um, another thing that you'll just want to watch too um, is if you have natural springs. Um, it's definitely an issue here in St. Louis. We've seen it a lot in Olivet. We've seen it a lot in Crystal Lake Park. Um, that there are actual sources of water, springs, that come right out of the ground. Um, and I'll tell you that a rain garden does not particularly help that issue. Um, plantings help, um, but a rain garden is probably not going to be ideal. So if you have a spot that's just consistently wet, regardless of really how much water we've got or if there's a downspout, you want to kind of check and see if maybe that's a spring um, because that's not going to be the best, best solution for that issue. One of the things you'll want to consider as you're designing or having somebody design your rain garden for you is how big that rain garden needs to be. So ideally, you are going to want something that is 20% of the area that's coming into your rain garden. So what may be coming into your rain garden is if you're attaching downspouts and burying them into a rain garden, um, you'll want to calculate how much of your roof is going into that rain garden. Um, you may be taking runoff off of your driveway, so you'll want to see the square footage on your driveway. Um, now, you can be in a subdivision where you have half the neighborhood's water coming through your yard to get to a storm sewer. That you're never going to be able to calculate and figure out exactly the size you need. Um, and when I mention the size of it, sure, in an ideal world, perfect world, we have that 20% size but any rainscaping is going to help your yard. Um, so especially like if you live in the city, there may be no possible way to create a rain garden that's gonna be big enough to take care of the, the load. So you can do a smaller rain garden and some other elements. You could also do permeable pavers because a lot of us, especially in a city garden, like to have a little patio space. So you could use permeable pavers that have gaps in between the joints of the pavers that allow water to move down through the paver and soak in. Um, you can just do native plantings. You can still do a small rain garden. You can do your rain barrels, um, but don't think just because you can't hit that 20% mark that you can't do rainscaping. You most certainly can. It's just an ideal. Um, as far as the depth of the rain garden, you do usually want it to be about 
six to eight inches um, on average. Um, that's enough to hold on to that water and let it soak in. Um, and you do want to remember, you know, even with that ideal size, we get some pretty crazy rains here. Um, so even with a system, because we have put in rain gardens that have multiple basins and bioswales and all sorts of elements that make a create a whole system, um, even when we get heavy rain, they're still gonna overflow. So you just have to keep that in mind, that it's just an ideal size, but it's not a hard and fast rule. So as you're creating your rain garden, you're going to think about the different parts of a rain garden and what parts you want to incorporate into your rain garden. Um, when you're making these decisions, what you're mainly going to be thinking about, what we were talking about before, is how the water moves through your yard, where it's gonna enter the rain garden, where it's gonna exit the rain garden. So that's gonna help you decide exactly what kind of elements you're going to have in your rain garden. So what most people think of as of the rain garden is what's called a settling basin. So that's the basin that's going to be six to eight inches deep, that slight depression. Um, this is going to be the lowest part of your rain garden um, where water will pond for 24 to 48 hours depending on the, the rain event. Um, this is kind of a tip, again, for working with your neighbors um, and educating them, as some people will see that sitting water and get panicky, think you're breeding mosquitoes. Um, but that whole life cycle can't happen in that amount of time. So that can be some education for your neighbors if they're at all concerned about it holding water. Um, and one of the other things that you might wanna think about, um, again, especially for front yard rainscapes, is you might wanna incorporate some gravel or stonework, um, especially in the inflow and outflow to prevent erosion, but you also might want to use it in the front yard so when it is holding on to water, it looks a little bit more like a pond than a puddle. Um, but that's, you know, completely aesthetic decision. Um, just might be something, depending on your neighborhood, that you might want to incorporate some stone in there. Then after you have your basin, you're gonna have what's considered the transition zone, and that's just kind of that slope around the basin. Um, this area is gonna dry out a little quicker, so when we get a little further down the line and you're picking out plants, you'll just want to remember that this area is not going to be wet all the time. It's going to be dry out a little quicker than your basin. Um, then you are gonna have a slight berm around the rain garden, and um, you're going to use your excavated soil from your rain garden basin to create this berm and keep that water in the basin. Um, and this might be an area, depending on the slope, where you might want to incorporate a biodegradable erosion control blanket, um, just so you stabilize that slope and berm until the plants establish. Um, another element you may end up having is coming from a driveway where you're taking care of some surface water or even from a buried downspout, things like that, is what we consider a bioswale, which is that is just going to be a swale, just a channel of um, where that water is going to go from point A to point B. Um, that's also often going to be your exit point too, as you might have a bioswale at that point as well. Um, so it's going to be your entry, how your water's getting into it, exit, how it's getting out into the storm sewers or the street or a creek. Um, basically what you're doing is you're directing that water flow across your property. Um, and if you are doing it with a driveway, you're going to run that rock along the, um, along the driveway to move that water. Um, Again, depending on just kind of the quantity and velocity of water, you may want to incorporate the erosion control blankets just so you're stabilizing everything until the plants have a chance to do that for you. Um, and then the last thing you're going to have is um, your overflow spillway, um, which this is going to direct your overflow. Um, what I will mention with this, um, especially for keeping your neighbors happy, is you want to try and not drain directly onto your neighbor's yard. It's best if you can have like a lawn buffer or something of the sort. So if we get a heavy rain, um, if any mulch gets washed out of the basin, you're still gonna have it on your yard where you can rake it back into the garden and it's not just spilling onto your neighbor's yard and possibly upsetting a neighbor. Um, 
And then you may just have some underground piping. Um, some uh, bioswales may take things above the earth, basically to move water from A to B, but you may have some underground pipes as well from sump pumps, French drains, um, and downspouts. And the question is gonna be asking now that you've got your rain basin is what plants you should be using. Um, it's gonna be based a lot on what part of your rain garden you're talking about. So you're gonna have different plants in the wet slopes compared to the drier slopes. Um, you also wanna pay attention to how much sun your rain garden gets. So you may have a shady rain garden, you may have part shade, you might have a full sun rain garden. So you're wanting, going to keep track of that so that you have plants that are going to thrive for you. Um, I will mention that the Missouri Botanic website has some really excellent sources, um, some spreadsheets that they have that will tell you moist to dry, you know, what plants will work best for you. Plus they also have their plant finder on their website uh, that you can put in specifically, I want a three foot shrub that takes shade. Um, so you can really use their system to find all kinds of great options for yourself. A um, couple things I'll mention again for kind of keeping the neighbors happy and keeping it um, well behaved is you might want to, especially in a front yard garden, keep plants a little bit lower or um, at least layer them so that um, it doesn't end up looking wild and making the neighbors nervous. Um, this might be an area where you want to use native ours, which is a variety of a native that um, might be a little bit more compact, might have a little bit longer bloom time, might have a larger bloom, things like that. They're just a little bit more well behaved for a front yard garden especially. Um, you also want to, especially in a front yard, and especially if you're a, a new gardener, is to err on the side of less different kinds of plant than more different kinds of plant because it's very easy for it to start looking messy when you have a lot of different plants. Um, and plus, as especially as a new gardener, when plants are just emerging in the spring, if you've only got, you know, 10 different plants to keep track of that you have masses of, when weeds come up, you're very easily gonna be see, well, I've got 10 of these and this doesn't look like it, so this must be the plant that needs to go. Whereas when you have a, a very, um, large selection of plants, it's gonna be hard when you're new at it to figure out which is what you wanna keep, which is what you wanna pull. Um, some of the plants that I'll just mention um, is for in the basin, we use a lot of different kinds of irises. We have several different native irises, uh, the copper iris, southern blue flag iris, um, dwarf crested iris, that all love water, really beautiful floral displays. Um, we do use some shrubs as well so that we um, kind of do that layering that I talked about. So our wild hydrangea is really great for our pollinators. Um, it's got more of a lace cap flower, um, lots of opportunity for our pollinators to use that plant. Um, another nice one are winter berries, uh, which are in the holly family. So you're gonna get those bright red berries over the winter, um, which are a great food source for our birds. Uh, so they usually let us keep the berries most of the winter and then they start eating them towards the end when they're getting a little bit hungry. So you have a really beautiful bright red fruit display through the winter, but then come end of winter when they're starting to really need those food sources, you are supplying that for the birds. Um, one of my very favorite plants for a rain garden is a perennial. It's called Threadleaf Blue Star. Um, really beautiful texture plant, um, great fall color. It's a really beautiful gold orange. Um, and it does have flowers, which I feel are just the bonus to this plant. It has a beautiful ice blue star shaped flower um, in the spring, great for our really early pollinators. Um, so that's a, a great texture plant that I like to use that, that works well in the rain gardens. Um, so you just want to make sure when you are choosing your plants that um, you're doing some massing, getting to know which ones are which so that you know which ones are plants, which ones are weeds, and you're keeping it nice and, nice and organized.
So you may be wondering exactly how you go about actually creating a rain garden. Um, first, you're just gonna lay it out. Um, at Quiet Village, we use basically a, a paint that we paint out the garden so we know exactly where we want to excavate the basin, where we want the bed lines to be. Um, if you're working on one yourself, you might use a garden hose is a really great way to lay out and see your shape and get a good feel for how big it's gonna be. You can also use flags, things like that. Um, one of the things you wanna make sure of when you are doing this again is protecting any root zones. Um, so if you're um, going to need to bring in any kind of machinery, things like that, you wanna protect those root zones around the rain garden. Um, to make sure that you're not harming any of the plants that you're keeping. Um, then you're going to start your excavation and grading. You're going to dig down probably 12 to 18 inches down and what we do is we actually mix your native soil, so we're keeping some of those microorganisms, um, with a compost um, and filling it back in to get that gentle slope of the basin. Um, so your, your eventual depth is going to be 8 to 12 inches. Um, you want to put that compost down in there and that's really going to help kind of act as a sponge right away. It's going to act as a soil amendment so that the water moves through better and it's also going to act as a fertilizer for your plants um, as kind of a slow release organic fertilizer. Um, if you um, need to, you're going to also create that berm. Um, around the basin and your overflow swale. Uh, then you're going to start planting after that. Um, best planting is late March to June um, and then back again in the fall, you know, September. September's a pretty great month. Um, mainly what you're going to have to worry about if you should plant outside those windows is watering. Um, you're going to, when you dig your holes, dig them as, just as deep as the plant, not any deeper, but about twice as wide um, for each plant. You're going to backfill with that soil compost mix. Um, if you're worried about erosion, you're going to uh, use that erosion control blanket. Um, and oftentimes, especially as a new gardener, you might want to leave your plant tags in because that's just going to make it a little easier for you come next spring to know exactly where plants should be emerging, um, what plants are where. Uh, then you're going to mulch after that. Um, you can use compost. You can use a leaf mulch. is really nice if you have a perennial heavy uh, rain garden. Um, you can use bark mulch, so it just blends in with your existing uh, landscaping beds um, and then you can especially if you've got these areas where you're going to possibly have some erosion you can use the decorative gravel as well um, and one of the big things you're going to have to worry about just in the very beginning is watering um, depending on how warm it is it could be every day it could be every couple days um, that first month is the very most important time for getting those plants established and keeping them watered um, and that's kind of another tip for just kind of keeping the neighbors happy is keeping your plants well watered so they, they don't start looking droopy or bedraggled, um, that they look fabulous all the time so your neighbors are impressed with your new rain garden and not worried about it. So I want to talk a little bit about maintaining your new rain garden. Um, rain gardens are sustainable, uh, but they are not maintenance free. So Basically, with the sustainability, it means they are going to need less water. Um, it also means that they're going to need less fertilizer. So those are ways it's kind of saving resources uh, with the rain garden. Um, it's also sustainable in the fact that it's going to be giving food to um, food and habitat to our wildlife. Um, so it's not going to have as much maintenance as a, you know, very tightly trimmed traditional landscape, um, but you are still going to need to do some maintenance on it. Um, so in the beginning, weed control is an issue. Um, that first couple of years, you are going to want to keep up on that weeding. Um, once your plants get established, they're going to outcompete those weeds, so it's not going to be an issue. But for that first year or two, you're going to want to get out there, especially if it's in your front yard, um, keeping it looking tidy. Um, 
And you also want to make sure with any landscape, with any living product, you're probably going to lose a plant or two. Just make sure you replace those so your neighbors aren't looking at your dead plants, you know, wondering what's going on with this new style of garden they're not familiar with. Um, edging and mulching, um, it's nice to keep a nice crisp, you know, just a shovel edge is all you need around that bed. Um, and keeping some mulch on there, um, especially along that edge to keep that nice, clean, crisp look. Um, again, kind of as those plants fill in, um, you're not going to need as much mulch in the garden, but it's still nice just for aesthetics to get that nice crisp edge. Um, and that is one of the things, you know, many clients do these things themselves, enjoy working on their yards. Um, but many of our clients, that's what we will come in and do is kind of a, a spring cleanup um, where we'll prune back perennials. Um, I will say we don't recommend doing any deadheading or cutting things back in the fall because a lot of these plants are going to be food sources and habitat for our wildlife over the winter. So it's really that spring cleanup and oftentimes for our clients we'll come in, trim back perennials. Um, we'll also, if any plants just need a little bit of shaping um, or if they have dead branches, things like that, we'll trim those out. At that time we'll do a little top dressing of the mulch and crisp up that spade edge. Um, you also want to kind of keep a tr keep an eye on your inflow and your overflow because sometimes you will get some sedimentation there so you might just have to take the hose on kind of the jet spray and clean those areas up so they're not getting kind of um, having a dam effect where where mulch or something like that is getting caught in those areas um, and it's usually as far as doing that cleanup kind of Early March is usually a pretty good time to do that. Um, most of the plants have been used as food for sources by then um, and you're cleaning it up before you get too much new growth so you don't have to worry about trying to trim around new growth and old growth. Um, fertilizing really isn't something that you should have to do with a rain garden. Um, usually just a top dressing of compost will be all the fertilizer your rain garden needs. Um, as far as watering, you're going to have to do some heavy watering that first month or so as everything gets established. But then once things are established, you really should only um, need to water during hot dry periods um, or true drought conditions. Uh, so it is more sustainable in the fact that you're not going to be doing a lot of watering or fertilizing, but you will need to still need to take care of it. Um, usually a nice spring cleanup is kind of the, the big maintenance event of the year. So just a few reminders when um, when you're putting in that rain garden and you might be the first person in your neighborhood that's putting one of these in. So you want to put kind of your best foot forward to really get other people excited about rain gardens and sustainable landscaping. Um, so again some of those things to keep in mind. Uh, try not to directly overflow your garden into your neighbor's yard. Um, if we get those heavy rains and every time your mulch is running into your neighbor's yard, it's probably not going to make them very happy. So try and get that buffer around there. So if there is some cleanup necessary after a heavy rain, it's still in your yard. Um, especially in front yard landscapes, again, you want to make sure that it looks like a purposeful landscape um, that, you know, some people that just don't understand sustainable landscaping will think it's just an area of your yard you've neglected if, if you're not taking good care of it. Um, so keep that garden looking very intentional. So what that means is kind of keep, keeping those clean edges, those mulched spade edges um, that give it that crisp clean look like any kind of other uh, landscaping bed. Uh, when it's hot and dry that means you might have to do some watering just to keep everything happy looking and um, keep things from wilting. Um, you might want to consider using some of the native R's, uh, which it's good to keep with plants that are still same flower colors, same flower shape, same leaf color so that the wildlife still knows what you've got and still can use it. Um, but these may be uh, more compact, uh, shorter plants, longer bloom times, things like that that just makes them a little bit showier, a little bit better behave for a front yard garden. Um, again, in that same vein, you might want to use some kind of lower profile plants so it's not getting too, too tall, too wild. Um, 
consider using just normal garden elements you would in any other garden. So maybe you put a path through there, maybe you put some stepping stones or make a little sitting area in there so you've got a bench. So it's very obvious that this is a garden. Um, if you're close enough to the street where people may be walking their dog next to it or taking the kids for a walk, you might consider some signage. Um, there are, through Deer Creek Watershed Alliance and um, MSD, there are there is signage that you can use in your garden so people know exactly what you're doing uh, with your plantings. And better yet, if you are out there when somebody's walking by, you know, you can talk to them and answer any questions and extol the virtues of rain gardening so that we're educating people, letting them know just how beautiful, while functional, uh, rain gardens can be so that we, we can have more and more people using them, establishing more and more habitat for our wildlife and taking care of more of that pollution in our uh, stormwater systems and our creeks.